Okay, so let's see what the afternoon will bring. We have a lot of interesting session in this track. Uh, first phase is more about upfront requirements management, user stories, and this is going to be interesting uh, set of sessions. My name is Faris Saracic. I come from uh, IBM. And today I'm going to talk about why we should care about requirements when we talk about Agile. And my topic is Agile development, why requirements matters. Uh, first of all, I want to thank our sponsors. This event would not happen without them. So if you are one of them, thank you. If you are not, think about next year. Perhaps you can talk with your company and, and see uh, they can support events like this. So what we're going to do is, is basically we're going to see why requirements in the first place. Why do they matter? Um, and then we're going to dive into some of the things that could happen if you do not have the good requirements. And we're going to kind of inspect uh, uh, what does it really mean requirements and, and uh, how do you actually compose uh, requirements. And uh, uh, because how many of you are thinking that you are practicing Agile? Okay, that's good, that's good. That's what I expect you at an Agile conference. How many of you are practicing waterfall? Okay. We have a couple of hands. So, there are companies who are still using a traditional way of doing the business. And uh, if it works for them, they can be successful. Uh, Japan, for example, where we, had, we basically say Agile came from the Japan, Toyota, uh, they are a very traditional country. They are very traditional from a business perspective. Uh, when we talk about Agile with them, they say, uh, no, we are more traditional shop of waterfall is good for us. Uh, in the last couple of years, I actually saw their transformation. And it's not because they are seeing there's, uh, uh, the compelling reason for them is they're driven by competition. Competition can do stuff faster, leaner, and, and that's what drives the agile from that perspective. So we're going to start basically, what happens if you do not do the requirements right? So if you're an agile shop, probably you have epics, you have a stories, but what usually those epics and stories provide you? They provide you a very brief description of what the end user told you, but it does not provide you description how you're going to actually implement it. So if you basically say, I want to have uh, headlights on my car, uh, I mean, you can put something miniature. It did not give you a specification how big, how small. Uh, you have seen probably a lot of chart kind of, uh, I want to have a swing and people create a swing in various shapes and forms. So requirements is key if you want to have a good and successful project. And I'm going to show you why in some specific cases you cannot actually avoid to having good requirement sets and requirements can be very deep. Uh, when I say deep meaning it's not just a description, you might have sketches, you might have diagrams, you have documentation that's very extensive. If you're in a regulated environment, um, there might be uh, requirements that are put on the business that you're in, on a product that you're building in. Now, if you deliver wrong things, what could happen? In US, it's very common that you use the wireless thermostat. Why? Because if you have a second house, like a uh, summer house, or if you live not in the States anymore, but you move to Austria like myself, I just moved to Graz, Austria, I need to still control the temperature in my house. But what happened is Nest have actually released a new version of the software. And it happens that they didn't think about consequences. When they released the new version of a software, 
what's going to happen if it fails? So it happened that a flavor failed during the winter time. And uh, in essence, in order to fix it, the developer said, oh, it's easy fix. It's just basically you need to power down uh, the nest and reset it. Well, my weekend house could be a few hundred miles from my house. There's no one there to reset it. And what happens is during the winter in the US, it's very cold, and the houses are built from wood, and literally wood. It's very thin, so temperature in the house is usually colder than outside. That means the pipes will freeze. And when pipes freeze, when it kind of start melting, it's basically it's going to burst with the water. It's going to damage the house. And that's really what happened. This is another case is there's a lawsuit claims regarding Fitbit because the information Fitbit provided were not correct. So you think you're healthy and, and everything is fine, but the information that you are collecting and, you, and, and you're getting are incorrect. And it could lead to a damaging situation. Think about some other cases. Uh, if you have a pacemaker and you have to update the version of the pacemaker, but uh, you kind of need to reset it first. So for 10 minutes, perhaps it doesn't work. That's not good. So those are the things that you need to think about it when you talk about requirements. What are the consequences? Now, luckily, probably majority of us are not working on a product that life depends, but it doesn't matter if life depends or not. What happens is, is, is the, the face of the company is on the stake. So if you release something like this, you will have hard consequences. And here's an example. When I bought my thermostat, because of this, I did not buy a Nest. I bought a different brand. And this is basically, to business, it's a lost revenue. So when we talk about requirements also, uh, there are a lot of challenges. I'll focus on three. So products are becoming much more complex. Uh, we live in a world where complexity is ever growing. Everyone is now connected. We talked about an example where I can actually take my phone right here, connect over the internet, and control temperature in my house in, in US. Is that simple? It looks simple. I just pull my phone, click, punched a few things, but very, there's very complex things that are happening in the background. So you're talking about connecting multiple systems. You're talking about system of systems. So there's a complexity involved. You have more suppliers involved. Uh, more components, and uh, it's not just you talk on the one lever, level, uh, you talk about hardware, you talk about software, you talk about ERP systems, and so on, and all, all have to communicate. As I said, they're becoming part of the larger system. Uh, you're going from predictable world to unpredictable world, world where you don't know what could have happened or what could happen if, if you do not implement uh, uh, your requirements correctly. And the last one is, it's a business challenge. It's, you, go, you have to either disrupt the business or you're going to be disrupted. Uh, we've seen a lot of companies who went on a, uh, on a top of the world and then disappeared just because they did not change the business models. Uh, Blockbuster is a uh, popular video renting company in U.S. that just disappeared. They did not follow the kind of leads of early uh, Netflix and, and, and kind of putting the movies on internet. They were traditional and they disappeared. And there's a lot of examples like that. So you have to basically learn fast, you have to decide, you need to act in order to be successful. Next, I'm going to basically tell you from IBM perspective, because I still work for IBM and, and I need to advertise them a bit, uh, not like Dave Snowden did, uh, though we still use the kind of uh, scheme with the taxi receipts. 
So requirements in IBM DevOps, uh, where do you actually start? Well, when we built any products, it starts with uh, actually with end user. End user creates the first feedback, and it might be to existing product. It might be to a new product or a new functionality. But we take that feedback, and it could be very simple, as, as you have seen in the stories and epics. A uh, couple of paragraphs uh, or even a sentence sometimes is enough. And we take that information and start building very deep requirements. Uh, we kind of elaborate on the details. We start sketching. We st start looking how that affects the rest of the systems. Because usually, as I said, the world is now complex. We're talking about systems of systems. And how that affects. If I change or introduce new requirements, what does it happen with the rest of the world? Uh, right now, I'm, I'm working on a project where uh, we are we're kind of creating a scenario of washing machine. And in this scenario, um, we introduce a new washing machine that washes in half a cycle with half of water uh, with half a detergent. And it's supposed to be something brand new that's going to drive the additional business for the company. But what happens is, is uh, uh, we monitor this advice, uh, washing machines. They are on the market, we're monitoring, and we're noticing that in certain regions, washing machines basically uh, have extra detergent residue. So what do you usually do in that case? You just wash it once more and clean it. So you spend, the point was you, you spend additional water and we're trying to save the water. So in this case, everything was set up properly we had the right requirement. It was tested even. But the test cases that we had had a few failures. And the failures were basically when we had exist, uh, excessive hot water. How many of you are familiar with what hot water is? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, so what happened is, is, is those few failures kind of they said it's insignificant in the testing. And uh, because these regions had really excessive hard, hard water, uh, they traced this requirement to a hard water. So what they have done is they refined the requirement to change it. And in this case, the requirement basically was, was the threshold was changed. They've introduced a fix and over the wirelessly, they updated all, the, all these devices. So the IBM story basically is you have continuous feedback. It starts with a, a user. Um, if you have existing product or you're building a new product, you want to get the stakeholders input. Um, as Dennis was telling, you basically start with st storming ideas. Just writing down the ideas, building it, and then start formulating those ideas uh, building something that you can actually deliver that leads into features, requirements, and then you start developing, and then development also looks how they're going to implement, goes into continuous testing, uh, release, uh, continuous release and deployment, and once in it's in a production, you start uh, your monitoring of the systems. So that's kind of a high level, and we're going to now look into a little bit deeper level from that perspective. So in this case, uh, we already have a product. It's, it's released. And the first thing that's going to happen is customer stakeholder will submit enhancement request. It might be a defect also. And uh, a person who is behind, it might be um, engineer, it might be developer who's going to get this defect, support engineer as well. They're going to triage it. They're going to decide, OK, uh, this is something we basically will put on a backlog, or if it's urgent enough, they're going to actually start fixing it. Now, where the requirements actually comes in a picture is the, the triaging, when it goes in a backlog, uh, it's going to stay in a backlog for always unless you start providing additional content. You start basically refining what was the thought behind a perhaps single sentence or a paragraph that the end user provided. So if we said excessive hard water is causing 
issue with my uh, washing cycle, I have too much detergent residue, um, that might be sufficient. But from an engineering perspective, you have to be concrete. What's the percentage? You need to have a sensors to monitor that percentage of uh, hot water. Uh, and and uh, how many machines in a specific region should you consider that that's a failure? So this is where basically we start with requirements analysis. Um, you go into the requirements analysis, you decompose the requirements, uh, you move to different levels, uh, and if you are business analysts sometimes, you're going to basically have user requirements, system requirements, functional, non-functional requirements, and so on. Next is you put it all together and you think about, well, I have change management where I introduce this defect and I have requirements, and people always say, well, those are two different systems. Now, really, from, from implementation perspective, we talk about two different implementation, usually. Uh, but really, you should be thinking this is a one, one system, and you cannot develop something uh, if you do not, do not have detailed requirements. So, how many of you are familiar with scale agile framework. Okay, a couple of hands. So very popular these days in, in, in the world is one of the top methodologies these days is a scale agile framework. And what basically is it does, it takes the concept of the scrum and project that into a, a higher level when you have a scrums of scrums. So you have a lot of small teams and it gives you a framework how you're going to actually work as a larger organization. So I mean, for example, uh, the group that I have uh, have about six, seven hundred developers. So what happens is you cannot put all of them in a single team. We actually break them down according to the products, according to the feature teams, scrums of scrums. Uh, we also try to actually uh, use the Spotify model and, and kind of test uh, how it works uh, as, as, as a tribes and, and uh, the squids? Guilds. Guilds, yeah. Uh, so we try that and, and kind of experiment uh, to see how we can actually improve. Uh, but SAFE is actually picking up very quickly these days and uh, uh, the reason I'm putting on a slide here is just to kind of give you an example where the requirements is actually found on a safe. And where, everywhere where you see a star, this is where there's a touching point with requirements itself. So it's articulated in the strategic themes, epic owners, uh, business epics, architecture epics, program, program epics, and, and, and here we're talking about system architecture. Uh, so this is for large enterprise companies. This is the latest and greatest and one of the frameworks that majority of them are trying to follow these days. Same thing is, in, is, is with IBM. Uh, not only that we are trying to practice SAFE, we also have built the SAFE into our tools. So I talked a lot about this topic, about requirements, but I do still have a lot of choices. I'm a small team. Uh, or I might be in a larger team, might be regulated, it, it might be uh, working on, on a mission critical system, uh, it might be working on a Fitbit that still uh, measures something. You don't think about that as a mission critical. But if you are measuring and your data are used to kind of give status of your health, that is a mission critical system. So it's not just kind of exercise, it is very dangerous to release this systems like that. So what I wanted to do is basically show you is when you have a small agile teams and you kind of compare that with regulated systems, what happens in that case? And I'm also putting a small stars just kind of show you what type of products IBM has uh, uh, in those cases. So if you want to Google and play with it, I'm not going too much to details. I'll, I'll just have a couple of slides afterwards, but that's going to be an interesting part as well. So small teams, um, it's usually someone who's not, re not regulated systems, building a products, 
uh, that's not a mission critical. It not, it's not part of, a, of a, a larger systems of systems. Um, so it's very, in those cases, you want to have lightweight requirement. And uh, um, that, that's acceptable, that you have a lightweight requirement as long as your development team can actually understand what the end user wanted to say. Because, you know, when you are not concrete and you're not specific, development will actually build a mountain and you actually ask for something very small. On a regulated system, and that's, that's where uh, the big uh, question comes in. I think everyone who is an outside in a company who does outsourcing business these days works with a larger system. The system basically that is systems of systems where you are building, where, uh, building a system which has regulation, which has a compliances. Uh, uh, it could be that you're working on a system for um, has FED, FDA regulations. It could be that you have a system if you're talking about Bosnia probably not as elaborated uh, regulations and compliances, but they are probably coming. Um, think about it, when you give a passport uh, or you apply for passports, even in Bosnia these days, you cannot actually go through for a third party and, and register for passport or something like that. So there are regulations that are being built even here. But uh, in this case, is you want to have a simple requirements where you can articulate the needs of the end users. In the regulated system enterprises, you really want to have a robust requirements. Uh, and when I say is robust requirements starts with, with kind of simple mission, what this requirement is supposed to deliver. And it's gonna have a lot of associated artifacts. You're gonna have a detailed description. Usually you will have diagrams, you're gonna have a sketches and documentation cited. What this also allows you later on to actually create, use this requirements to build the documentation and approve to the regulators that you have met all the uh, uh, specification that they have asked for. Another thing uh, that's, that's being used is uh, basically to provide the information that you have done your due diligence to meet all the, all the expect, expectation that the system have done. For example, uh, you probably have read that the Yahoo uh, accounts were hacked, about 500, uh, 500, 500 million emails, uh, user information were, were stolen. So now they're basically asking, did Yahoo did everything in their power to protect this information? And really goes back to the requirements. If they can prove that they have done everything in their power to protect it, they're fine. But if they, if they could not trace that they've done good requirements gathering and good requirements, security requirements in this case, that's gonna be a lot of problem for Yahoo. And their merger, or acquisition by Verizon uh, might be also something that's, uh, uh, that's gonna actually lead in, in, in um, abandonment of that acquisition. I'll just spend a couple more slides and we're gonna talk about two tools that uh, we in IBM use. IBM Rational Team Concert, uh, it's used for change and configuration management. Um, what it basically provides you, it's open workflow management platform, which means is you have ability to create your own workflow. You can change the forms that you utilize uh, out of the box, depending what type of uh, uh, configuration you're working on. So we talk about safe, there's a safe, there's a light scrum. There's also a tra tra traditional team template there's a things what we call the uh, ALM template and so on. But what it does, it's, it's basically workflow. If you open a defect, what's supposed to happen next? Who's gonna review it? Uh, uh, when you change the state of this defect, uh, uh, is developer supposed to assign it to someone, work on it, implement it, and so on? Uh, 
Uh, but it's a very light from that perspective. And uh, uh, it provides you collaboration platform. And what's most important is it's tied to the rest of the portfolio that, uh, that IBM provides. Uh, and it's built from the grounds up and linking all the traceabilities. And we said key is to have proof that when you start from requirements, you can actually tie that to your development, you can tie it to your testing teams, and you can trace the information. I have built this requirements, I have implemented, this is my code, you can see associated code, and then on the end, you have tested it. And of course, you build a release and release it in production. It also provides the ability to have a change management. Uh, you can use Git, you can use uh, built-in what we call a Jazz SCM. So probably uh, majority of you might be using Git or might be using SVN or something of, of that nature. On the other hand, so this is something more light uh, uh, for small teams. Something that's uh, for larger teams is uh, the OS next generation. This is the place that basically provides you very deep uh, capabilities that you can build your diagrams in a tool itself. You can associate with the uh, schematics that you might have in uh, different tools. Uh, you can build systems of systems, uh, different architecture of these requirements, and, and so on. Uh, and most important, it's, it's traced. So it's connected with all the other tools that IBM provides. So with that, uh, uh, I'll just basically say, this is the first session of this track. Uh, we started talking about requirements, why requirements do matter in Agile. Uh, we'll continue with Matteo. Uh, Matteo will be our next speaker. And uh, he will talk about uh, similar talk about requirements. Let me find his presentation.